back to Maxix 2021's virtually from the comforts of home and practice. The topics that we we'll discuss now will be on the post-nasal surgery. Does the mucosillary clearance play a role? My name is Junes. I will be the moderator for these sessions. Before we proceed, please remember to check in at the top left button so we can record your attendance for the CBD point. Also, please attempt the pool poster in the sessions during using the QR code so we can get to know you better then. We have couples of few, few of those housekeeping details to go through with you. The live stream session today will work based on the webinar formats. If you have any questions during the talk, there's a button present which you can click to submit the questions. The questions will be directed to the session's moderators, then we'll discuss if the time is permitted then. Our speaker for this session is Dr. Muhammad Hafiz bin Muhammad Ali, consultant, ear, nose, throat surgeon from the SGMC. Dr. Muhammad Hafiz earned his medical degrees for M. Shams University of Cairo. He's, he completed his surgical and ENT trainings in UK, UK. Upon completion of the study, Dr. Hafiz practiced in UK for three years before returning to Malaysia and servicing the local community for the next 27 years. He has made his mark in the governments and private sectors where he have been actively participating in the teaching hospital as well. Dr. Hafiz's special interest in the pediatric otolaryngology and the non-invasive sinus surgery would be a valuable insight for all the audience today then. So before we start our Dr. Hafiz sessions, let's look at the pool, let's look at the pool results. We can see that uh, which treatment option will you consider to treat the known infectious rhinosinusitis? Well, I guess that most of most of you guys are selecting the saline irrigations. Please attend. Then we may start the sessions. 80% of you guys are selecting the saline irrigation then. What else? Antihistamine. All right, we have a mixed response of antihistamine, saline irrigations, and some of you guys are selecting the corticoid steroid. Let's hear from the Dr. Hafiz from an ENT surgeon's perspective. Uh, whether what would be the option to use when it comes down into managing the rhinosinusitis then. So please welcome Dr. Hafiz. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Hafiz from Subang Jaya Medical Center. I've been a consultant ENT surgeon here since early 1996. I'm very pleased today to be invited uh, to talk about this topic of does mucociliary clearance play a role in post-nasal surgery? Here is a photograph of a live surgery of the nose and paranasal sinuses uh, using the latest technique in her hospital uh, two weeks ago. I regularly perform this endoscopic uh, nasal surgery, uh, <clears throat> which is minimally invasive since 2008. Over the years, I've had experience of an average 120 cases a year. And together with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Hussein, who has been performing the same surgery uh, since much later in 2009, we have a uh, quite a convincing figure of uh, nearly a, a thousand over cases over the last eight years. Next. Uh, looking at the memory, this was me in Dublin 1985, in the middle of uh, my training uh, in basic uh, surgery and uh, ENT uh, in 1985. Uh, the Star reporter, the Star newspaper reported in 2012 that there are 3 million Malaysians suffering from sinusitis at any one time. That is uh, a fairly uh, large number. Of that, there are 18 million cases of sinusitis per year we should uh, think of ways to minimize this or make the patient suffering from this uh, illness uh, more uh, comfortable. 
Of course, uh, sinusitis is an illness which initially can be treated medically with antibiotics, corticosteroids, and saline irrigation. However, there are cases in which the medications and nasal sprays and rest doesn't work. This is when uh, the ear intersurgeons are called to give their opinion should the patient undergo surgery. The indications of surgery are many, but among the important ones is that, as I've said earlier, in chronic sinusitis patients who failed medical treatment. Other causes that think, uh, that may uh, think us to go for surgical options earlier is that in acute sinusitis, we have gone into orbital or intracorneal complications. In case of children with sinusitis, we frequently see in the 80s and 90s, patients suffering from orbital cellulitis. And in certain cases, orbital cellulitis, we need to go in uh, to drain the pus from around the orbital area, which is near the sinuses. In other cases, acute sinusitis with clean, no clinical improvement after 24 to 48 hours of IV antibiotics, these are not normal nowadays, but in cases that we have immunocompromised patients, in patients who have uh, uncontrolled diabetes, or in patients who have um, uh, neoplasms of, uh, and other parts of the body, we need uh, surgical treatment to drain the sinuses so that they don't go into intracranial complications. Uh, there are patients who have chronic sinusitis, but uh, fairly surviving, but they, they want a better quality of life. So uh, they do not want to use medications and sprays anymore. So in such patients, we may consider surgery, but on an elective basis. Talking about functional endoscopic sinus surgery. This form of surgery is considered fairly recent. As a senior ENT surgeon, I've gone uh, through earlier periods before uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery or FASS as we summarize it now. We used to have uh, minor surgery like bilateral enteral washouts. And then if it's not improvement, and there's no improvement with it, we proceed to intranasal enterostomy, and finally to the operation called Calvella, where we open the maxillary sinuses from uh, inside the lip and then open up the maxillary sinuses and clear them off of all the pus and the unhealthy lining in mucosa. But unfortunately, uh, this operation do not really uh, stop the recurrence of sinusitis. Uh, and they are fairly traumatic surgery. In case of Kaluela, we'll have a patient suffering from numbness around the lips and also uh, dryness of the nose due to over uh, removal of uh, mucosa from the maxillary sinus and some uh, the walls of the uh, nose as well. And it doesn't treat the other sinuses like frontal and uh, sphenoid sinuses. In cases of frontal sinuses in the olden days, we used to open up through uh, the upper eyebrow and then drill into the frontal sinuses and clean them up. And then put a drain and wash it daily in the ward until the uh, pass clears up. So with the functional endoscopic sinus surgery, we um, got rid of all this old, uh, olden times, uh, old time surgery, and we are more uh, uh, um, we are more uh, preserving the function of 
uh, the nose and sinuses while clearing their sinuses. Uh, their sinuses. So, as you said here, there is lower complication rate and other symptom relief than conventional sinus surgery. Whatever it is uh, that we do in uh, nasal and sinus surgeries, the aim is the same, being relief of nasal obstruction, maintain and restore the mucociliary function, and improve the sense of smell. The figure shows here the rate of improvement of symptoms with patients in chronic sinusitis. Uh, of course, uh, of the many mentioned here, we are more concerned with uh, the, the common ones like nasal discharge and nasal blockage. And the numbers uh, given in the figure from Sivakuma in 2011 is quite impressive. You get improvement uh, in 85% plus from nasal discharge and 89% uh, from nasal blockage. So talking about the mucosal damage in uh, nasal and sinus surgery, it is inevitable in the early forms of surgery like I mentioned earlier, but as uh, years go by and uh, <clears throat> surgical techniques improve uh, and also added to that uh, uh, research done in, in the laboratories by the scientists uh, studying the nasal and sinus mucosa, <clears throat> we have come to a conclusion that uh, the less we do, the aim being the same, but we do uh, less damage to the nasal mucosa. We now know uh, that there is such a thing as mucociliary clearance. Uh, normally, as we saw, the nasal and uh, sinus linings through the old uh, light microscope, we see only uh, just mucosa. But with the invention of electron microscope, we can see much bigger and we are surprised to see that uh, they have uh, cilia. The microcilia are like small hairs that move in a certain direction to uh, uh, bring the mucus that is produced by the nasal uh, mucosa itself and uh, which have caught uh, the dust and all the dirt from the air, the nose breathes in, down into the nasopharynx. Uh, as you can see here, they have uh, documented in 2012 the appearance of no normal sinus uh, nasal epithelium with a very healthy uh, cilia compared to the nasal mucosa which has suffered from chronic sinusitis. In practical term, chronic sinusitis means that the patient has been suffering for about three months or more. As you see here, it's just like a desert where the cilia all damaged and uh, you see mucus sticking all over the place. They have done studies as well. Uh, by Inanti in year 2000, uh, in patients with uh, sinusitis uh, prior to surgery, uh, what's the appearance of the nasal mucosa under electron microscope compared to the control group with patients without sinusitis and the post-operative group uh, after surgery to the sinusitis. Uh, after surgery to the sinuses. Uh, you can see here that uh, there is damage, whatever you do, uh, to the nasal cilia. Uh, but it is better than uh, not doing anything at all. The same uh, uh, studies by Inani S in year 2000 shows that 
in patient who has undergone endoscopic sinus surgery, uh, the nasal cilia remains impaired after two weeks. That means uh, for more than uh, for more than three months, the patient uh, nasal uh, lining has not returned to normal. Talking about the common completion of uh, sinus surgery, uh, general practitioners might not see this because they're at that time they're still under the care of the ENT surgeons in the ward or later in the clinic. Uh, you have uh, post-operative bleeding, uh, which is rare nowadays. Uh, nasal sinicia means the mucosa of the nose gets stuck to the mucosa of the septum or the mucosa of the uh, 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 turbinates get stuck to the, uh, the, 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 the um, sinuses, uh, 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 the sinuses the entrance as well. These are uh, long-term complications. But well, compared to the post-operative bleeding, we normally occurs uh, within a week, uh, not real, not uh, necessarily the first 24 hours. Okay, nasal packing are done by ENT, the ENT surgeons uh, to stop post-operative bleeding. Uh, we do regularly put nasal packs in nasal surgery, which we think uh, will bleed after the recovery from general anesthesia. Uh, we have gone through the generations where we've put a uh, ribbon gauze soaked in a paraffin, uh, the, the old time BIPP pack, bismuth iodoform with paraffin. Uh, we don't do that much anymore. <clears throat> uh, over the years, we have developed into a generation nasal pack which does not have to be removed with the discomfort order of removal resulting uh, from re on the second or third post-operative day in the ward. Uh, in my practice now, uh, we use uh, a, a certain uh, brand of uh, uh, nasal pack which begin dissolving by itself on uh, the second uh, POD. With that, we encourage the, the, the dissolvement of the nasal pack by uh, asking the patient to spray with uh, 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 sea water or normal nasal spray. And then we assist the removal uh, by su su sucking the nasal uh, cavities uh, after the third post of trip day uh, and then after a week. The studies by Pandia in 2006 uh, <clears throat> observed that the nasal packing is associated with longer clearance time of the uh, nasal mucosa. We need to talk a bit more of mucosillary clearance. As we know now from the <clears throat> studies made uh, through electron microscope that uh, mucosillary clearance is a vital uh, mechanism in uh, clearing the nasal passage and to a certain extent the pharyngeal passage of the dirt that we catch in <clears throat> during our daily life at work or at home. And uh, <clears throat> if you see here uh, in the diagram of the cells of the nasal and sinus mucosa, uh, the cilia move only in one direction. That is uh, inside the nose uh, towards the uh, post-nasal face and pharynx, inside the sinus, into the nasal mucosa, and inside the lungs, uh, up into the throat to be coughed up or to be swallowed, as you see in this slide. <clears throat> uh, these are the details uh, that uh, the researchers, uh, many of them uh, from all over the world, have studied. If uh, <clears throat> you are interested, you can uh, refer to the articles, uh, but for Practical purposes, uh, 
uh, as we said earlier, the cilia needs to be moving, and they call it as in the D, the beating cilia. And immobile cilia, if present, is uh, not of use to our to our body. Okay. Uh, these are detail details again of the further function of uh, muco uh, cilia, and also the research done in mouse uh, that uh, the increase I mean, muco cilia secretion appears to exhibit a protection against inf influenza infection. So this contributes to the body defense mechanism. Uh, further slides on the uh, mucosal clearance, as you can see here. Now we go to topics uh, which are more familiar to me, being a uh, consultant ENT surgeon in uh, active in private practice. Uh, how do we manage a uh, patient who has undergone, uh, undergone uh, nasal and uh, sinus surgery? Okay, the aim being to promote wound healing and the regeneration of mucosa and reduce local inflammation and infection and improve the patient's symptoms, which is mainly uh, blockage uh, due to the swelling of the mucosa of the nose, headaches due to uh, presence of uh, mucopus in the paranasal sinuses, or simply due to ne negative pressure of the air inside the sinuses uh, because there is no uh, uh, no air, air, uh, patent airway between the nose and the sinuses. And of course, uh, with the recent studies, we know that just uh, doing surgery and clearing the nasal airways and removing polyp is not enough. We must make the ciliary function functioning again for the patient to be nasally and sinusally healthy. Okay. Uh, these are details uh, for the surgeons to appreciate that, you know, uh, the healing process, uh, uh, what it should be, uh, uh, and uh, clinically it should go through which period. The uh, the things that we do in management of uh, uh, post nasal and sinus surgery uh, are mentioned here, but we can classify it further into what we do uh, in the ward before the patient gets discharged, and what do we advise at home. Uh, between the discharge and the next visit to the to the clinic to see us. So <clears throat> I tend in my practice, and I'm sure uh, my ENT uh, colleagues will agree, uh, that uh, uh, in the ward, uh, the first uh, one or two days, uh, there's nothing much except administration of antibiotics and uh, painkillers if they need it. And uh, I usually call them uh, the day uh, before uh, they go home, uh, normally uh, the second post-operative day, to come to the clinic and examine their nose and have a look whether uh, the nasal packs are beginning to dissolve. And if it does, uh, then to start uh, uh, applying suction to remove some of it so that the patient can breathe more. And then I will advise them to go home on uh, medication that I prescribed containing uh, nasal irrigation, uh, mainly seawater nasal sprays and some antihistamines and the continuation of the antibiotics. Okay, the slides here uh, talk more of nasal irrigation's role in improving the symptoms after chronic sinusitis after surgery. The aim of nasal irrigation is actually to prepare the nasal uh, mucocilia to function again. So, uh, for it to function, 
we must get rid of infection, whatever it is. Uh, and we must remove obstructions due to uh, polyps or uh, nasal mucosa uh, swelling. So we must clean all the mucopus, which is the body reaction uh, to the chronic infection. And also we must uh, make sure that the underlying epithelium and mucosa become healthy by moisturizing it. Okay. <clears throat> Degabery in 2019, uh, which is quite recent, has uh, made the research and discovered that the elementary solution in the nasal uh, sprays uh, uh, significantly improve the mucociliary uh, clearance uh, on the day 14 uh, and day 21. Okay. Over the years, uh, we have graduated from cleaning the nose, uh, either healthy noses or in our case, uh, post-operative, uh, post-nasal and sinus surgery noses with saline uh, to seawater. I remember personally, uh, while I was in training in the early 80s uh, and mid 80s, we were still using uh, saline water or sodium bicarbonate powder dissolved in water and using syringe to clean the nose, uh, either for infections or post uh, As early as uh, late 1990s, talking about 1998 and 1999, uh, we begin to use the seawater nasal sprays. Uh, there were only one brand at that time, and we used to call it the French seawater. I, I don't want to mention the brand now. Uh, and we discovered that it does help uh, and the patients feel more comfortable and it's more convenient. And uh, now we have got many different types of uh, not only nasal sprays, uh, containing seawater, but also nasal douches. Um, this is studies of what the seawater elements contain. Uh, you see they have, apart from sodium and chloride, which is uh, only present in normal saline, you have a magnesium, copper, zinc, selenium, carbonates, uh, and etc. Gary, as early as in 1920, has made a research on magnesium which is a powerful stimulant of ciliary movement. And of course, uh, it gives in details here uh, also the roles of sodium, potassium, calcium, uh, and weak acid. We talk more about magnesium uh, and its role in energizing the mucociliary clearance. Gout in 2014 has found out that the magnesium uh, energizes the mucociliary clearance by improving the electron transport chain. So, because of that, he concludes magnesium ion plays an important role in ATP hydrolysis. If you are interested in this, you might study the biochemistry a bit more. Now we come to the next question. If you want to use the nasal seawater spray for normal colds or for this routine uh, nasal cleaning in healthy people, or most importantly in uh, post nasal and sinus surgery, which one is the right one for you? Of course, we go through three uh, important uh, features, quality, efficacy, and safety. It's been found that 
Adriatic Sea water is one of the cleanest sea in the world. As you see from the map, the European Environment Agency has found out that the highest quality oligotropic seawater is one of the best in Europe. As you know, Adriatic Sea is present on the eastern side of Italy. Uh, it's between Italy and uh, Bosnia, Exosupina. Okay. This research, uh, Kiselev in 2001, has found out that the Adriatic seawater improve the symptom of rhinitis, which is uh, part of a normal cold, uh, by two days, from four to two days. That's quite significant. And the same researcher found out that the Adriatic seawater improved the symptom of rhinitis uh, in more than 79% of the patient showing breathing improvement compared to not using uh, the Adriatic seawater. And also, Another researcher, uh, Chakash Shivil, in 2004, found that the Adriatic seawater, by using regularly the Adriatic seawater spray, it reduces the need of usage of systemic drugs, for example, uh, nasal decongestant tablets and antihistamines, by 47%. This is quite significant. The same researcher found out that Adriatic seawater improved the mucociliary clearance by three times, as you see in the figure. Compared Aquamaris, which is one of the brands available uh, in this country, and Control. The same uh, researcher, Kiselev in 2011, has found out that the Adriatic seawater improved the mucociliary clearance. And uh, he found that it's uh, uh, by half of the mucociliary clearance time is improved. Uh, in this case, he, he was using uh, Aquamaris, which is one of the preparations uh, containing Adriatic seawater as compared to the control. From the Aquamaris product insert, uh, we observe here on the slide that uh, there is uh, APF, which is a uh, short form for Advanced Preservative Free Pump, uh, which is uh, approved by Wood Manufacturing Standard. And as you know from uh, our previous slides, that uh, Aquamaris, which is one of the Adriatic Sea water nasal sprays, is enriched with magnesium. And we have mentioned earlier in detail the role of magnesium in uh, enhancing mucociliary clearance. Uh, to chronic sinusitis and, of course, patient after nasal surgery being managed by the ENT surgeons and later general practitioners. Thank you. One, go. Thank you, Dr. Hafiz. That's a very interesting talk. So it seems like for those patients who did not work well with the conventional medical treatments right then, they have to go with the surgical approach then. So even with the surgical approach, we still need to work as we need to think about so what will be the approach for the recovery. So have overwhelming question from from the from the audience so i will just share share with dr harpy with some of the questions i hope that dr harpy can help us address this question then so the first question that we got in here was like oh this is quite relevant with the cold weather that happened in a couple of days ago uh frequent sneezing in the cold weather and blocked nose so what would be uh, dr harpy's uh, recommendation uh, every uh, event uh, not everybody has this 
what we call hypersensitive um, the antigen uh, termed as vessel motor ranitis. And the nasal line is excessively mm. to the change in weather, causing it to swell yep. nasal breathing. Yep. Uh, you may take uh, mm. or antihistamines and epinephrine uh, preparation like clarinase or telepathy. Yep. A couple of these. Uh, there's no issue as long as there's no uh, secondary infection on top yep. of All right. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Hafiz. So there's another question with a concern on the, on the usage of the steroid nasal spray then. So the question is, for those patients who are undergoing the endoscopic long, we should put them on the steroid nasal spray therapy. Okay. There are a few opinions on this. Mm. I'm from the old school of thought, which uh, I do not really favor uh, using a steroid nasal spray after surgery mm -hmm. uh, as compared to using them uh, for just acute uh, sinusitis uh, without surgery. Yep. Uh, the reason being is that uh, with the wound in the lining of the nose, you might delay healing. Yep. But uh, there is another group of uh, ENT surgeons which and which have uh, good reason uh, to continue using this uh, nasal spray because uh, the argument is that uh, intranasal uh, steroid sprays uh, markedly reduce the swelling mm. that follows uh, surgery and uh, releases the, uh, the patient's uh, symptom of nasal blockage much earlier. So, uh, to be fair, if you are using it, I think you continue for about uh, uh, 10 days to two weeks. Mm. After which, uh, by that time, the wounds of, on the mucosa of the uh, nose and sinus would have healed and uh, you, you let the natural process take its, its, uh, its, uh, its course. No? All right. Sure, sure. Thanks, Dr. Hafiz. It looks like it, in case you decided to use the, the steroidal types of treatments, 10 to 2 yeah. weeks is a recommendation duration yeah. set. Yeah. So we have a questions on the saline irrigation. Um, is the saline irrigation mixed with the butosonide with pulse superior compared to the nasal steroid spray or nasal irrigation uh, alone? So we're talking about um, saline combined with the butosonide. How does it compare with the nasal steroid spray or the saline irrigation itself? Yeah. I myself sometimes combine the budinocyte and mm. saline, but the budinocyte yep. is also part of the intranasal steroid sprays. It's just yep. one, one, one brand, one mm. category. Yep. There are cases in which uh, you need to relieve the swelling mm. of the lining of the nose after surgery, as well as clean and loosen the dry mucus and dry blood that is stuck to the nasal linings. So we can use it together, but I usually ask my patient to put an hour interval between the two sprays. Mm. And uh, duration-wise, it's about the same as the just using the intranasal steroids um, between 10 days to two weeks. But following that, I usually advise my patient to continue uh, as a matter of hygiene mm. to use the seawater nasal sprays. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Mm. Thanks, Dr. Hafiz. It looks like the, the purpose of those, these two um, options are a little bit different. The steroid is for inflammatories, while the saline is more towards the cleansing purposes. And of course, for the purpose of hygiene, the doctor may recommend to continue to use a saline water then. Well, yes. This is actually an interesting question about the snoring. Can the sinusitis lead to snoring during the sleep then? <laughs> okay. uh, there are patients who has already uh, anatomical abnormality in the nose. Uh, the ENT surgeon and even uh, my colleague general practitioners are aware that the deviated nasal septum is present in 70 to 80 percent of the normal population without giving them any symptoms. Mm -hmm. But once you have sinusitis, chronic sinusitis, with the lining of the nasal mucosa 
swollen, the nasal mm. breathing become narrower, especially yep. on the side of the bends. The, the, for example, you have deviated nasal septum to the right. Yep. With chronic sinusitis, rhinosinusitis, your mm. nasal blo blockage on the nose, right side of the nose is worse. So, uh, this uh, we have to, uh, to take care of it uh, by surgery as well as medications and sprays. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thanks, thanks, doctors, uh, Doctor Hafiz. So we have we have another question that is uh, relevance towards the uh, balloon side sinoplasty. So the question is, when is the balloon sinoplasty indicated for the cases of those are refractory or chronic rhinosinusitis? Okay. There are two opinions on this. Yep. Since balloon sinoplasty is fairly recent, mm. in my practice, I started my own, um, my first balloon sinoplasty in 2008. Yes. And to my knowledge, my other colleagues in ENT started just a year earlier than me in yep. 2007 because the first uh, batch of surgeons from Malaysia who went for training in the uh, United States was sent in uh, late 2006. And uh, those who did not want to go for training, because we think it's not really, uh, we don't want to really learn any new surgery when the established ESS was good enough. We were persuaded to attend uh, a second training in Singapore uh, in 2007. And by 2008, we all started having a look uh, at the option of doing a balloon sinoplasty. Well, Twelve years plus. Hmm. It is really um, if you want to go with a modern thing uh, anatomically hmm. and also going uh, purely scientific ways of preserving the nasal mucosa and getting the um, uh, ciliary movement normal again, you should go for the minimally invasive one. And balloon sinoplasty because to the sinuses doesn't puncture any hole into the sinuses like the in the FESS. We only go through the natural sinus ostium or opening, uh, which is the same thing, and uh, open it up with balloon, just like we open up the. Um, uh, uh, the, the heart uh, coronary blood uh, arteries with balloon, we open up the sinus openings, uh, maxillary sinus, uh, sphenoid sinus, and frontal sinuses opening uh, with a certain pressure. Uh, with that pressure that has been calculated uh, by research, we keep uh, the sinus patent even though there is edema of the lining. Yep. So the result being, after dilating the sinus and washing whatever dirt in the sinuses, we keep the anatomy intact. This is what called minimally invasive. In, in, in the States, for many years, because of the high cost of hospitalization, my colleague ENT surgeons uh, have informed me that they are doing it as an outpatient procedure in the clinic. While here, we still do it as inpatient because the insurance uh, cover for it. Uh, invasive surgery of balloon sinoplasty and functional endoscopic sinus surgery, the cost is uh, very much different. The, we are talking about, um, I quote, 22,000, for, uh, for balloon sinoplasty and uh, 12 to 13,000 for FPSS. So here, financial uh, implications has to be considered too. Uh, so most of the time, I leave it to the patient and I leave it to the insurance coverage that they have and I tailor it. I tailor the management according to what the patient can afford. Hmm. The aim being the same, to relieve them of their symptoms that make them miserable due to the chronic sinusitis. All right. 
Thanks, thanks, Dr. Hafiz. I have one last question. I'll take the last questions. If I have a long list of questions that are due to the interest of time, I can only take one more question. This is actually quite an interesting one. I'm quite sure that um, probably it's an ENT surgeon as well, these doctors. So these doctors had encountered a patient, had gone through the FESS, and then doing a, redoing a, re, a revising FESS due to the chronic sinusitis and deviated uh, nasal septums. So post-operative four years, then the patient have a complaints of post-nasal drip and occasionally having a foul-smelling mucus and sinus headaches. So the patient had been self-medicated with the regular antihistamines. So the question is, would a daily seawater nasal douching or spray will help these patients? Okay. Uh, unless I see the patient mm. and examine him and look into his CT scan of the sinuses, mm. I cannot give an accurate answer. Yep, yep. But from my experience, there are patients who have gone uh, full extent of surgery in functional endoscopic sinus surgery, but still have the symptoms. Mm. But when we examine the nose in the clinic, it all looks normal, all looks nice. The nasal airways are patent. The septum or uh, the nasal septum are already straight. Mm. But we still see post nasal drip. And if you do the CT scan, I have a few patients now that they have undergone uh, FESS in other uh, centers and come to me for treatment. The, surprisingly, the CT scans are, are normal. So I conclude from my observation that these are patients who have hyperreactive mucosa. Even though the sinuses are all clear and the sinuses are patent, they are not blocked from the remaining uh, nasal cavity, they are still over-secreting. Sure. So in such cases, using a, a saline or seawater nasal cream may help mm -hmm. in just getting out all this uh, uh, hyper-secretion. Yeah. But it doesn't treat them. Yep. So uh, there is no need to take antibiotics, but you may take antihistamines and off and uh, as on uh, PRN or when uh, required basis. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Hafiz. It's, it yeah. seems like for the hygiene purposes that the, the salines are washing will be helpful in these groups of patients as well. Yes. So it comes to the very end of our session today. So uh, I would like to... Um, we we'll ask that all the audience today is right. Please um, uh, click in into our slides. We have two more questions to talk about our learning experience today with Dr. Hafiz as well. So please go in and then uh, sign in and, and, and answer to the questions we posted in the slides. Then we can close the sessions uh, shortly. So thanks again for Dr. Hafiz and thank you for all the audience. I hope that uh, all of you guys have gained a lot of insight from today's sessions then. So, so the question that we posted, what are the benefits of using the seawater uh, nasal spray? So there are quite a number of choices. Either it helps in improving nasal readings, reducing the use of systemic draw or shortenings in terms of mucosal clearance. So what, what's your takes after learning today's sessions? So we have uh, most, most, of, most of the audience are responding that it actually helped in all three of the uh, functions here. So we have one more question, then, then we can close the sessions. Okay, so majority of the audience that answer that, it can help to improving mucosilic clearance, um, faster, faster improving in nasal breathing and reducing the risk of the systemic usage of the systemic drugs. And, Thanks everyone. So let's move on to the second question. Just one quick one. So do you think the seawater nasal spray is able to benefit the patient you see in the current practice? Well, 100%. So I guess that's a majority of the patient, majority of the audience here will see that the seawater will be a, a, a lightly uh, options, very uh, lightly options for the for, for their patient then. Okay. Thank you all for all the responses. We also thank uh, Dr. Hafiz for the very interesting sessions then. So our next session is in the topics of management of lower urinary, urinary tract symptoms, which we will start at 4.20 then. So stay tuned to join the sharing sessions by Dr. Gore.
Thank you very much. Catch you all later. Thank you. Thank you. See.